ringrazio molto la Fondazione IPSA, il nostro partner, e, che ha reso possibile questo evento e anche grazie alle IPSA, dico subito, dopo potrete anche vedere o rivedere la mostra di Giulia nel meno due del museo, penso che questo qui sarà l'introduzione proprio perfetto. Grazie mille a Giulia Charrier di aver fatto, portato qui questa bellissima mostra, grazie a Delia Hanna che va a moderare questa conversazione questa sera. Quindi ringrazio Silvia Misitti, Giovanna Bognandi e Claudia Mazza della Fondazione Ipsa e subito possiamo passare alla conversazione, non prima di aver ringraziato anche tutti i nostri colleghi del Masi, soprattutto Valentina Bernasconi e Gregory Berth che hanno co-organizzato con i colleghi dell'Ipsa questa serata. Passo la parola subito a Silvia Misitti, grazie e buona serata. Grazie direttore, io salgo sul palco perché sono, sono alta abbastanza per farmi vedere da tutti. Allora buonasera anche da parte mia, eh, vi ringrazio di essere qui. Oggi è il nostro evento incontro conversazione numero 6 di questa proficua collaborazione con eh, il Masi di Lugano, quindi siamo molto contenti, veramente sono tre anni che è nato questo progetto che si chiama La Scienza Regola d'Arte. E stasera forse raggiunge, eh, diciamo non sempre riusciamo a eh, invitare e a mettere in conversazione l'artista che nello stesso momento ha eh, la mostra presente qui. Quindi invece ecco stasera questo riesce, quindi come vi ha detto il direttore poi siete tutti invitati a visitare la mostra eh, qui, qui sotto. Quindi da parte nostra è un, un saluto, un benvenuto da parte di Fondazione Ipsa, il direttore ha ringraziato già tutta la squadra, che sempre lavora ma che io vorrei ringraziare ancora quindi Giovanna Bognandi e Claudia Mazza che lavorano con me e Gregory Bert e Chiara Gubbiotti tutti gli altri del Masi che hanno permesso di perché anche una, diciamo un dialogo tra due persone richiede tanto lavoro nel senso che noi studiamo i personaggi studiamo ovviamente la mostra, il loro lavoro c'è cioè la creazione dei materiali e anche se come vedrete la conversazione sarà molto libera perché poi partiamo da un, da un punto e non siamo sicuri di dove arriveremo alla fine, eh, c'è comunque un, un minimo di, eh, di lavoro e di regia che dobbiamo fare eh, prima per eh, capire eh, che anche un po' Diciamo quali messaggi e quali approfondimenti questa sera mh, lascerà a tutti voi. Eh, per questa conversazione abbiamo una moderatrice d'eccezione che quindi chiamo, eh, Dilia Hanna, che è qui tra noi, che è un, dicevo, una moderatrice d'eccezione perché è lei stessa eh, una, una ricercatrice, filosofa, quindi esattamente a metà nel suo background tra studi umanistici e studi di scienza scientifici, quindi sarà una moderazione eh, di eccezione perché saprà esplorare eh, entrambi i campi con eh, grande maestria. Eh, la chiamo qui, eh, Dilia, eh, e lei vi presenterà i nostri personaggi. A più tardi, grazie. Um, so, welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with Julian and Felix on the occasion of Julian's exhibition downstairs, Words No Unearthly Pole, um, which has been a project developing almost since the time that I met Julian in the unlikely place in Antarctica. So I'm quite excited to be here tonight to talk once again about ice and the many ways that we can come to see it. Um, Julian Scharrier was born in Moore, Switzerland in 1987 and now lives and works in Berlin. In 2011, he studied at the Institute for Realm Experiment or Spatial Experimentation, which was led by Olafur Eliasson. And during his career, Julian has exhibited both individually and as a member of the group, the collective Das Naumann and museums and institutions around the world, 
Uh, I won't list them all, They're, it's an ever-expanding list, but including the Musée Antonin des Beaux-Arts in Lausanne, um, the Central Suisse de, in Paris, the Palais de Tokyo, the Haus de Couture der Welt in Berlin, uh, Kunsthal Wien, um, many, many more, which we'll elaborate, including the, I believe, Julian was the youngest participant in the 57th Venice Biennale, which was quite an accomplishment. Um, most recently, his first solo show in an Italian institution called All We Ever Wanted Was Everything and Everywhere um, was held at Mambo in Bologna, beautiful exhibition. Julian has won many prizes, including the Kiefer Hobbits Award during the Swiss Art Awards in both 2013 and 2015, the Kaiser Stipendium for Jungkunst in 2016, the Berlinische Gallery Prize um, for an artist engaged with the natural sciences, as he is tonight. Um, and I think he's really one of the most exciting uh, artists of the generation. And it's been certainly provocative for me to think with since, since we met a few years ago. Um, towards no, no Unearthly Pole, um, the exhibition on view tonight will travel from here to first to Arrow and then to Dallas. So there'll be many opportunities um, to see and think about this exhibition moving forward. Uh, Felix Keller is a glaciologist, and I think it would be quite interesting to look at this film a bit through your eyes as well. Um, Dr. Keller received his doctorate from the Laboratory for Hydraulics, Hydrology, and Glaciology at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, or ETH Zurich, on the subject of interactions between snow and permafrost. Since 1987, he's headed the current European Tourism Institute at Academia uh, Engadina, and in 2004, he received a lectureship in environmental didactics at ETH Zurich. Um, since 2015, Academia Engadina has been developing the spectacular Mort Alive project for the care of the Motorash Glacier, along with the uh, Graubünden University of Applied Sciences and the University of Utrecht, and we'll hear more about this exciting project tonight. Um, he is also the president of the Ice Stupa Association, which supports the Ice Stupa project in Ladakh. And I should add that his projects are musically supported by the duo Tango Glacier. Um, and so we'll be quite interested to hear not only about the technological details and um, scientific um, reasons for these studies of glaciers, but also some of the scientists' motivations and feelings about um, the subject of study. And here we find uh, a very interesting subject of um, exchange between an artist, a scientist, and um, in which I hope to contribute a, a bit as a philosopher. So we'll begin by hearing from Felix. I've asked him to speak a bit about his research, um, as well as what brought him to study glaciology. So we'll begin with you, and then we'll turn to um, Julian, who will tell us a bit about the exhibition that is on view and how it also came to be. Buonasera a tutti, grazie a Fitch, Berlin Wied, the near God Alengedina, a Lugano. Thanks for the invitation to come here to Lugano. And it's for me a great pleasure to tell you not only about something about my scientific work, but also about my feelings. This is the first time that I have to speak about the feeling as glaciologist, and this is for me a great pleasure. And just here you will see the first picture of my career. It was the first day of field research in the Swiss National Park in July 1985. And my professor told me that if you want to investigate permafrost, you must consider that you will never see what you investigate, because permafrost is normal, invisible. And I have seen the permafrost the first day. And this was very important. This is my most beautiful picture. We'll see later that the color of blue is for me as glaciologist a very important color. But then I switched to the glaciers, like here, the Mortarat Glacier, one of the biggest glaciers of Grisen, maybe also the one of the importance glacier or best investigated glacier of Switzerland because the Dutch people from the University of Utrecht, they started already in 94 with the longest record of the energy mass balance, which is now a key 
factor for our glacier protection project called Mortal Life. But glaciology has also other feelings, like, for example, the lake ice, which you will see in this picture, where we have to consider the properties of the ice, for example, for the security of white turf in St. Moritz. Yes, and so I did about 15 years, a lot of research in glaciology, especially snow and permafrost interactions. And then I realized that glaciology could be in future an important research field because everybody knows that all the glaciers are disappearing, but much more important is how they change their behavior as water reservoir, that all the water will flow away and maybe the future generations, they will not have enough fresh water in dry mountain regions. And this is just an example of such a high mountain region. It's the region of Ladakh in the Himalaya region. 221 million people, they are highly dependent from the freshwater reservoir which is stored in the glaciers. And when the capital of Ladakh, the town of Leh, which has about 30,000 inhabitants, will lose the glacier which is marked in a red circle, then they have not any more water. And to live without water, I don't know how this will work. And though they had the idea to build the, their beautiful ice stupas, to store the water which, they, which goes waste in winter time. And we were so fascinated from this idea that we decided, the village of Pontresina decided to build the first ice tube in Europe after to show that we are highly good friends of the Ladakhi people in the Himalaya region. Yes, and then let's see what happens at the Mortaraj Glacier. The glacier retreat is actually very fast, and it's not only a part of our herd with which we will lose, it's also a freshwater reservoir. And therefore, the question was, should maybe glaciers be maintained as freshwater reservoirs for future generations? Because I think the, our children, they will not ask if we didn't see what happens with the glacier. It's so clear what happens. They will ask what we have done. And this was the origin for the so-called Mort Alive project, La Morte, and to make the Mortarat glacier again alive. And the idea of this project is quite simple. What would happen if we would collect all the meltwater which occurs in summertime and we would use this meltwater in wintertime to produce artificial snow without electrical energy and to cover with this snow the glacier in order to protect him against the sun radiation in the next summer. On this picture you can see how this would work. You can see the glacial lake in the left side and then we calculated with a flow line model from the University of Utrecht. This is also the location where the University of Utrecht, Professor Hans Oerlemans, installed an automatic weather station to measure continuously the energy balance. And his calculations shows that when we are able to cover 10% of the surface of the Mortrach glacier with snow during the entire summer, the length of the Mortrach glacier will increase in about 10 years. The length will increase, not the mass. The mass will be in the area of the tongue more or less stable, but the length could increase. This was a really fascinating idea, but our calculations shows also that we need a snow system which produces about 30,000 tons of snow a day without electrical energy. And this is now a part of an 
innovation project, which is supported by the Swiss Agency of Innovation, InnoSwiss, to develop together with the snow cable construction company Bartola a system which could ground independent produce the 30,000 tons of snow a day. And this is our vision. With about seven of such snow cables, we can produce the snow cover which reflects the sunlight so that the glacier is completely protected against the summer heat and the sun radiation. And so we hope that this technology, which could be a central factor for slow down the glacier retreat in areas where the fresh water from the glacier is for the surviving of the people important that we can use this technology. Ilya asked me also to speak a little bit about my feelings as glaciologist. And I think a glacier is a part of my heart. But I had also to ask the question in my heart, what, is, what are the key parameters which motivate me to work for this solution? I think there are three factors. They have all to do with vibrations. Vibrations we can see as blue light, like here in a cave in the Mortaraj Glacier. But not only to hear the vibrations, uh, to see the vibrations only, also we can feel the vibrations. So as a young child, I was always, when the snow was melting, I was quite not so happy but much more happy in the month like this when we have got the snow. And the last point where we have the vi where my vibrations are for the glaciers, this is the combination, music and glaciology. And I hope that our music you have heard from Tango Glaciar could contribute to our motivations to do something for our future. Thanks for the attention. Thank you so much, Felix. It's, it's really extraordinary to um, hear such a, on the one hand, a kind of romantic and aesthetic and personal vision of the glaciers, and on the other hand, um, a very rigor rigorous technological approach um, to envisioning their, their future and how they might be preserved. So I'll, before I, I say anything further and ask you um, some questions, I want to turn to, um, I think this makes a, a wonderful introduction to Julian's approach approach to glaciers, which are uh, a very different vision. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here again. Uh, I almost feel at home now that I'm like since almost six weeks uh, here in Lugano. And it's very nice. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ispa, for having this conversation. Uh, and thanks to Bia and thanks Francesca for having me here. Um, yeah, I will just say a few words about the show that perhaps you all have seen, but if not, uh, we're very happy it's open today, so even after the talk, maybe you can take some time and, and lay down in the darkness of the underground of the museum. Um, Towards No Earthly Pole, it's a project that I start two and a half years ago. It's a project which actually start with a failure. Um, I was invited uh, on the Antarctic Biennale, which was a very interesting invitation. Why doing a biennale in Antarctica? Why doing a biennale for the ice, for the penguin? Why doing something without the public? But I think that the actual biennale was trying to reflect on uh, the power of narration, and the project would be translated through images, through stories, um, through emotion, obviously. Um, for this project, I actually decided to build uh, a big machine, uh, a, a piece of weaponry, a cannon, a ca coconut cannon that you might see downstairs. And uh, this coconut cannon should have shoot a uh, bikini and coconut, which is I took from another project. I'm, I won't talk about all the projects, but basically 
a coconut which is uh, slightly uh, radiated emittent uh, seeds from um, the South Pacific, which I would have shoot towards the South Pole and would have land and act as a little clock and slowly go down, down, down till it reached the ground and perhaps uh, grow a coconut tree there. Um, obviously, the project didn't happen because as I was testing the cannon at my studio in Berlin, um, the German police uh, hear about it and raid the studio with the special forces, confiscate the cannon, and uh, it was kind of the end of the story, which somehow was interesting as well because it became such a mediatic buzz, which was totally unexpected, that it is actually uh, create a very strong link to the topic of this particular biennial. But still, um, once I embarked the Russian vessel and, uh, in Ushuaia, and we were heading over the Drake Passage toward the Antarctica Peninsula, I had nothing to do. So <laughs> I was hanging out a lot on the, on the upper deck and uh, just staring in the darkness. And we had a few nights, stormy nights, and uh, as I was staring there, with uh, sometime with Delia, sometime with Nadim, which curated, which is over there, um, we had this really, really, really strong moment of this huge iceberg appearing from the dark, and they were appearing because what was quite special on this boat is, even if this all this technology, sonar, radar, once the storm was there they will still have a very strong spotlight. And one guy will just scan the emptiness, this kind of like very stuff darkness of the Arctic Sea and, and look for the iceberg in order to actually avoid them. And so he will scan, 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 and at some point a giant piece of ice will just appear and slowly disappear. And it was a very, it's a very moving moment, this apparition and disparition. And I, I just, totally so that this was something that I really wanted to kind of try to recreate uh, in, in a filmic approach. And uh, that's the basic beginning of the project. And what you see here is actually not the project, but a little bit of the stage, how we then make uh, the movie which don't stay possible, actually creating a very strong light, which was attached on a drone and this drone will fly over um, the icy landscape and another drone will film and it will start to be a dance of light and shadow. And uh, I think it's, it's a very strange process that I didn't expect as I start to work with because it's very intuitive. It's uh, nothing like doing a video. A video, normally you have a script and you know what you're shooting and you have a proper structure that you try to kind of like um, follow, but in this moment here, you can never know what you expect. So it's a little bit like the sculptor, which is looking in the shape and always redoing, but you can never do twice the same take. So there's, uh, there is something uh, very creative and very special about trying to manage uh, to actually freeze this little moment of light and shadow. I don't think I will tell much more, but that's kind of the base of a project. And it's not only about that, like the project is like uh, <laughs> over a, a, a few continents, a few places. I think that's also something which is really important. It's about our imagination and about the construction of our reality and how we actually uh, project ourselves in space. And this space become kind of a complex system, a complex architecture within which we're actually thinking. And um, this video is similar. You, you're actually flying from Greenland into Iceland, into Antarctica, and then back in Switzerland, but you never really know where you are. So it's all about like this kind of uh, projection and phantasma. And uh, I think that's something we might also talk a little bit about, because one thing which was really um, fascinating me about your project is that you're also trying to save an image, because the Morteraj, which was also in the project, uh, we actually started Morteraj after Antarctica, which was quite interesting, did all the training there, and, and actually having some picture in, in, in the movie downstairs. 
and um, there is kind of like a very, str very strong image because it was like one of the end of the Grand Tour and, and therefore we have a huge tradition of this uh, kind of panorama of High Engadin and uh, when I get aware of your project I was very fascinated by the fact that you were actually trying with a technological apparatus to save an image which is kind of floating in the consciousness of many people. So maybe you can tell more about that because I understand that obviously the project is also about um, the proxicity and, and, and the water, but I think that this idea of like saving an image is also something that I would like to hear. Yes, so I think what I realized that nearly everybody which I know they have a good emotional connection to the glaciers. Maybe everybody of Switzerland thinks that the glaciers are a part of our country. And though you are right, it's maybe also the idea to save an image. But the functionality that the water which is stored in the glaciers, I have learned it from the Ladakhi people, that they are highly dependent, but I have also learned from other things from the Ladakhi people. For example, a sentence which I remember be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And I think this may be also what you are presenting are solutions. Well, that's also something that also was very uh, interesting when I discovered what you were doing, that um, obviously in the actual discourse about climate change and all the problem which occur, there is normally the scientific take is a lot of data production, it's a lot of knowledge production, and, and probably this data and this knowledge is about trying to find solution, but mostly uh, we always depict the problem in a negative way, which is um, somehow difficult to act out of this kind of negative sphere because it's terrible what's happening, but when I discovered your project, I saw that it was very beautiful because there was like a strong hope and I think that hope is something which uh, will help us um, to actually be part of the solution. So that's, uh yes, I agree. I think actually we must realize that we have, there is a big gap between the knowledge about climate change and what we are doing. And the gap can be reduced if we are motivated to handle, and this could be hope. And if, uh, when I heard Sonam Bangchuk, the inventor of the ice stoop, when he told to his schoolboys, we have not to fight against the problem, we have to use the problem. And though this is a other kind of view, and if we are able to turn the climate change discussion in a positive way, I think we have more energy for acting than we believe. I think you raise an, an interesting question, which is um, if we're going to take this the problem of climate change very seriously and have not only hope, but actually some very practical um, strategies for combating particular problems like the loss of um, fresh water, drinking water from glacial retreat and such. Um, it also raised the, the possibility that in the process of, of um, trying to address these problems, we might really change the way these landscapes look. And I wonder, I would like to actually ask both of you about, um, can you envision a world in which perhaps um, fresh water, drinking water provided by glaciers has been secured, it's been stabilized in many of the regions that depend on it, from the, the Andes to the Himalayas to, to Switzerland as well. But um, perhaps everywhere there are um, systems for producing fake snow or these artificial, the ice stupas, artificial um, glacial formations. Perhaps the mountain range looks completely different but it functions in the same way. Um, is, that, is that something that you can imagine? Is that an, a sort of a vision that you could accept? Um, and Julian, you, you are also producing images that are very unfamiliar. They're actually composite 
landscapes. They're, they're not um, just the same beautiful glacier that we've been enjoying for a few hundreds or thousands of years. Um, is it, are you proposing a kind of alternative image of, of what these glacial landscapes m might come to look like? Well, I don't think in the case of the movie it's, uh, it's, it's the case, but I think it's an interesting question. I believe that we are already living in such a world. Um, if we think just about Switzerland, if we think about the bears, the wolves, those are animals which disappear because of our species and we reintroduce, which actually changing the landscape in kind of like a, a loop which is looking in the past and trying to recreate, but it's al highly artificial. So the question is, yes, definitely, I think that we won't be able to survive without adapting and co-producing our reality. And um, I think that we just need to be very sophisticated about the way we deal with it, because there is also a lot of danger about this issue you're talking about, like there's also a lot of uh, unknown about uh, geoengineering and things, but I, I believe that we are already one step too far on just discussing the question. We just need to discuss how we adapt to those problems and what would be our response. So, Felix, can I pose the question to you um, also from a, a technological as well as a cultural perspective? Um, through your research and that which you know about the other people that you're in dialogue with, are, are you envisioning a world in which the landscapes would be very transformed in order to sustain their function? Um, I think that the landscape is always transforming and the question of to have enough fresh water is maybe the oldest question of every society. And therefore, it's not only a question of research, we have no alternative, we have to have enough fresh water. And the way how we collect it may change, and this change also the landscape. And so maybe an important thing which is also a part of this film is that the glaciology had influenced me, but maybe we should also think about the opposite way, how we can influ how we do influence the landscape, but in a positive way. And so this all will reduce the question if we are looking forward to the future or not. Um, maybe I can ask you to tell us a little bit more about what you see in, you've seen a bit of the film and you see some of the scenes of how it was made. Um, Felix, how, how did your training as a glaciologist change the way that you see ice? Because what I, what I wonder is if you actually can see things in these images that would be very different than what I could see. I mean, for example, can, can, you, see by, um, can you see in the film or in images of ice how old it is, where it comes from, whether it comes from fresh water or salt water, for example, just with your eye? And I think there are two phases. The first phase, when I was a student, it was important to learn all the scientific methods to do good field work. But then in the year 2005, there was a change because then I had the lecture. I got the lectureship at ETH in Zurich. And then the question was, how can we teach environmental topics in a way that the people change their behavior. And so I learned also the importance from the psychologists, and they told us that the principal factor is the motivation. And then I realized that maybe my music, which is a very important part of my life, could also contribute, and this opens, this was the starting point of the second phase. And though I think culture and science, they have, uh, they have to collaborate because both are important. So Julian, I'd like to ask you a little bit about how, um, how perhaps in your work you, you put this into practice as an artist. Um, you are perhaps a, a kind of cipher, a, a mediator for the kind of questions and emotions and curiosities that many people have about these environments, but you often take your, your, those curiosities to an extreme that is, uh, it's, it's quite 
different from what from what other people do. Um, your work is very technologically intensive, and it's also very geographically specific. And we often find you in places that are dangerous, um, <laughs> difficult to access, uh, expensive to um, and, uh, to reach. And so, why? What is it that um, is important to your artistic practice about uh, traveling to these places, for example, diving a nuclear bomb crater, flying a drone with frozen fingers, you know, persuading someone to take you on a boat way too close to a, a calving glacier, is what Felix is suggesting that the, that the arts might kind of put us, really evoke a changed relationship to these environments. Is that something that you're experiencing through um, this kind of production process that we're seeing on the screen here? Yes, I mean, I, I believe that uh, today artists need to expose themselves. And uh, I think that uh, there's more and more and more artists which are actually going out and, and, and doing what scientists um, call field work. Mm -hmm. And those field work are very different and they're also different mean. And, uh, but, but they're similar in the way of the methodology behind it. And uh, for me, I don't think that it's particularly important if it's dangerous or if it's like a nuclear crater or um, the ice cap. That's, that's just what dictates my work and my research. But I think that's, uh, yeah, it's highly relevant for us to go outside because we need to kind of create within a larger system. And I think in the case of... Um, of the poles, both south and north, but particularly south. It's a place which has been mostly described by uh, science and, and data and observation. Obviously, before it was maybe uh, also bound with expedition at the beginning and the challenge of, of reaching both poles, but there is a certain uh, iconography which became um, popular culture, which in inherited from science and which is actually great that we have it, but I think that uh, artists today could also react on that and create new realities. Therefore, I also decide to work at night because I really wanted, I mean, I have a, a big passion towards those landscape and I wanted to do something there, but I also don't want it to create one more uh, movie about a space which is kind of like have been overexposed for the last five years. I mean, we've seen a lot of these images and it's great that they are circulating, but I wanted to kind of like try to depict the dark side of the polar region and therefore I take, take the night as a stage because the night is much more uncanny, the night is kind of non-existing, the night is uh, extraterrestrial in the fact that a normal human day always is actually tacted on sun and night and there you have total darkness for 24 hours at some times, here not, but some of the, some of the trip we had. And I think that it was very uh, important for this process to kind of like try to, um, to show this darkness. And the darkness is also very helpful to create this fictional space that you see downstairs because it's allow me to stitch different places the same way how a brain and understanding is stitching different images to create what we call reality, a reality that we mostly share, but which is also highly subjective. Yeah, I'm glad you addressed this question of um, work, why working at, why do you work at night? Because in, in some kind of initial way, um, Felix, you've also talked about this incredible glow of the blue, this seduction of the color of ice, which is so familiar, it's almost, almost an optical illusion. Um, and yet, the ice, of course, exists also at night. And um, in the Arctic, for example, there are even communities that live through the winter and, and experience this at night and are also very much impacted by um, the rising temperatures at the poles and at the high latitudes. So I think I, I just want to dwell on this um, question of, of what happens um, through these images of seeing the ice in the dark. Because in a way, it's um, it's so unfamiliar, in in contrast to the the kind of seductive image that might draw us towards the poles or towards the glaciers. So I'm curious, Felix, um, 
I'd like to ask you a little bit about your field work experiences, but in, in particular, um, have, do you work at night or, or do you glaciologists work at night? <laughs> no, at the night we are sleeping, we are dreaming about the glaciers. But sometimes we have also made some experience, for example, in the permafrost research also for the interactions, but these are unusual. And so I think this is a very special experience. And I'm wondering if you have seen the darkness as black or in blue colors. The darkness was mostly gray, actually. Gray. It was never really dark. <laughs> I mean, in the movie, it's, it's darker, but actually mm -hmm. the, this obscurity is a very strange kind of like gray curtain, which you couldn't, I mean, it's very di different than the night we have here. It's never really dark and you can actually navigate quite well. So it's a, it's a very a strange space. And a strange color palette, obviously, too. Yeah. I, I appreciate that you say that at night the glaciologists are dreaming. And are, are you dreaming of glaciers then? As the first time I was within the glacier cave of the Mortrat Glacier, I dreamed several days. This was such a beautiful experience. And I think this this picture is still today present, mm -hmm. which I have showed before. Oh, it's, um, it's really fascinating to think about the way that uh, we have to adjust our eyes in order to see what, these, um, what the ice has to tell us. Um, first, on a visual scale of, of being, coming to see the differences and the variations in the colors and the textures. Um, and then, of course, in, on a, a deeper level of, of kind of learning it, what it's trying to tell us and its, its messages. So I, I wanted to uh, follow up, Felix, uh, a little bit about the project, this project to preserve the Martyrosh Glacier, which we've discussed in terms of its cultural value. Um, but what are the implications of these types of projects for uh, the global problems of climate change and a kind of glacial retreat worldwide? How, how much can, might we hope that these types of projects could be a model for, for example, um, saving the G Greenland glaciers, which are melting very rapidly, or perhaps repairing some of the cracks in the Antarctic ice sheet? No, I think that our project will not be a solution to save the Greenland ice sheet, because this is such an, an enormous volume. The volume or the mass from the Mortrach glacier alone is 1.5 billion tons of ice. And the only meaning of this project is to save a freshwater reservoir for the people which is, are living there. But on the other hand, because we are doing something, it creates a lot of motivation. And if this project contribute also or to our motivation to do something against climate change, then this is another contribution. But the direct impact is only a technical solution to help the people which have not enough water for surviving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I understand they are being deployed potentially in, in some other areas of the world. Um, the, the snow, um, the sno fake snow system, uh, the snow, ah, you tell me what it's called. Sorry, can you repeat? Um, I understand that it, the, the technology you're developing is also potentially being deployed in Antarctica. Yes, there exists a group from the Potsdam Institute mm -hmm. which is thinking about also to protect the Antarctica, mm -hmm. but this is completely another scale. Mm -hmm. We were in contact and they asked me if the Swiss technology could help, and then I had a very modest answer mm -hmm. because I think I'm happy if the first snow cable will work. And from the Antarctica, the calculation shows that then we need about 8,000 snow cables. And so I'm happy if the first will work, and then let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do hope that the snow cables are, turn out to be um, very useful technology. And, and if, they, if they would function as a kind of, I imagine they're almost like a, a thread sewing back the, the glaciers, um, I wonder if the effect would be something, as opposed to restoring a landscape that's familiar, something closer to what you've done, Julian, which is a, 
creation of a kind of patchwork of landscapes that looks um, both a little bit like uh, many landscapes we've seen, and in another way, if you look more closely, nothing like that. Can you tell us a bit more about um, what we're seeing in these images and how you arrived at um, this practice of layering these glacial elements from different locations around the world? Um, where, where are they from and, and what are they evoking? For me, it was very much about creating a, a known space is kind of a, a space which could be everything and nothing at the same time. And um, in a technical point of view, it was actually matching images together and making them live in one frame, which is not that easy because you need to kind of like, well, normally you can track a shot, which is a uh, camera track to have like one moving images and one stable camera and then you can imitate the movement of a camera. In this case it was very complicated because as I say, because of the intuitive aspect of the production, we uh, had like one light moving and one camera moving, there's no point of orientation, which is very important for the project because you need to be disorientated and you kind of need to also take the time once you look at it to just like slowly float in this unknown. I don't want it that people recognize it, but I also kind of like the familiarity. So it's very important about uh, this image, and it's also what fascinates me about all the polar um, imagery, is that we have a strong emotional link to places that we didn't experience. I mean, the North is obviously uh, inhabited, but we still here have this kind of strong connection and that's something that um, that motivated me to kind of articulate or mediate a project about because I, I mean if you ask someone hey, how it is looking like in Antarctica everybody have a strong image a vision and somehow the north and the south sometimes they flip someone like believe there is penguin in the north and polar bear in the south so there is slightly a misunderstanding of the geography and that's nice that those two poles can actually be flipped around somehow in, the, in, uh, in our own uh, construction. But then it's also about deconstructing the space and deconstructing also the places which have been helping to create this popular visual culture. So therefore I went to the Mont Blanc because I thought it was very important, the Morterrach as well because also it's like in, in this part of the world, and, and then to go to, um, to South and, and, and North Pole, and directly at the pole, but like as far as I could go. And, um, and then to, I mean, it's again like the same thing, the movie is very, it's like an intuitive moment when you are producing because everything needs to kind of slowly um, slide and melt within one other. Um, I don't know if this is an answer to the question, but it's, uh, yeah. It's certainly suggestive. Um, I wanted to ask you also, where does the title come from? And is, is there uh, an image or a story or a kind of dream of the Arctic that has been especially captivating for you in your imagination of these regions? Uh, the, um, the title comes from a poet, uh, Mr. Tennyson, which uh, actually created this poem for uh, Captain Franklin, which at some point, after a lot of research, uh, was declared as dead. And so it was kind of an epitaph to his last travel towards um, yeah, the overworldly. And I thought it was very interesting because the it was very suggestive of the moment. For me, there is like this idea of a moment where the construction of a reality is not really matching the actual object of observation. Meaning that uh, if the ice is melting, people will still have the vision or have like this background, cultural background of the ice, even if the ice is not there anymore. Like if Mortaraj was disappearing, there would be a, a very long moment where Mortarage was still kind of acting as a, a very active memory and we will still have like this 
stories to tell, but the actual object will have been disappeared, and there's like a, a slight uh, gap between these two moments, and that's um, that's why I, I decided to use this title because like the whole project is about projection and construction of image or um, world image. Mm -hmm. Felix, is there a, a story or, or a piece of music um, that's especially important to you and your imagination of glaciers? Yes, when I listen to you, Julian, I think I just am thinking about, about the images. And I think every one of us is driven by inner pictures. And last year, we made together with 52 friends a concert on the Mortrach Glacier. And as I realized, this concert produced a lot of new pictures, of inner pictures. And this is now the aim which we want to do next year, to repeat this concert, but with children together. And we hope to give these children inner pictures which they will bring into the future, to believe in the future. Because I think, actually, what we hear from, for example, Greta Thunberg, a lot of young people is angry about the future. And I think we have to motivate them, for not only them, also you, for to do the work which is necessary for a good future. And to do this, I think the music, as well as films can contribute. And just a quick question. Will those new pictures include uh, snow machines and ice stupas? And uh, will they be very different pictures for um, the next generation? For my children, when they think of a, a, a glacier, will they picture a um, kind of device that sustains it? I don't believe that snow cables will produce new inner pictures, but we don't know. But what I think what we can do is to change, to, to change the behavior. Mm. And then if we have also the picture of a beautiful glacier, and we have also now beautiful glacier areas, so we can motivate. Yeah, I wanted to ask you just about like this music because I think you're not alone uh, playing for Glacier. There are people in Iceland, in Norway, and uh, I think it's uh, very strong and poetic. But I was kind of like willing to know um, why not also playing to the rest? Because uh, it's always born with Glacier. Is it because Glacier are more alive? than the rest of the landscape, because they also produce concert, because they're also kind of speaking to us, or what, what, what would you say, why, why is the music and the glacier so near that um, different people in different countries are actually doing it? This is a difficult question, which I don't know the answer. What I know, I told this story from Mortal Life in the fiddle school, which I am participating every year. And then all the colleagues, they asked me if I would invite them to come to make a glacier concert. And this, I think, they have, they wished to, to play the music because maybe both are a part of their hearts. But to know why, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a lovely question. Um, also, as I imagine that you were struggling to decide what kind of sound to bring to this film as well, Julian. How did you, what, can you tell us a little bit about the score and, and how you arrived at this kind of music? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a mix of um, actual recording that we did with a, a piezo microphone within the eyes, an idrophone, under the eyes, and, and different moments of the production. And, and then, as well, I work with Robert Lipok, which is a, a great producer in Berlin. And, and before I really start, I ask him to actually maybe think about how this thing sounds, because he didn't have this experience, or he didn't have the possibility 
to be with us out there and, and didn't have like this sound uh, cosmos. And so I just asked him some question like, how is like a snowflake melting on a microphone? How that sound? And how is actually two icebergs grinding on the floor of an o uh, ocean? How would that sound? And then he kind of like make some responses and then we had again a kind of a fusion um, between reality and, and fictional space so that you're kind of not really able to um, take one from another. So that's, that's what you hear downstairs, it's a, it's a mix and then it's composed by him. So it's also his response to the images. It's, it's also a kind of imaginary soundscape of, yeah. of an imaginary landscape. Huh, fascinating. Um, so I think we, we reach, start to reach the limit of our time together. But I would like to ask you in the spirit of this lecture series a bit about um, your experiences or, or of your hopes as an artist and a scientist in dialogue. I know that, um, Julian, you've had many engagements with scientists and um, engineers in your work. And Felix, I, you're, it's fascinating that you're also playing music yourself and... Um, I understand is dan perhaps dancing tango. Have you collaborated actively with artists? I pose this question to both of you of um, what, what it is like to work together or to be in dialogue or what you think is the potential of um, artists being in conversation with scientists and engineers. Oh, it is great potential. I've been very uh, happy to have the possibility to actually work with scientists before from the uh, Seismographic Institute in Potsdam. And um, I'm also very pleased that Paul Vetsia and the Swiss Polar Institute are actually putting a program together to kind of uh, create some couple of like researcher, uh, scientists and, and artists which are also working in the field. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and we uh, there is a lot of similarity in the way we approach the world, but there's also a lot of disparity. And, and, and those are um, a particular um, uh, fruit, fruitful for kind of like also for me and like the way I engage with the world. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that also today, this possibility to have this talk, it's, um, so I think there's like a, a lot to be done. And also it's, it's a long tradition. But, For me, it's surprising that nearly at every glaciological process, uh, congress, there is also music which is done by the scientists. We have, from the Academia Engiadina, we have collaboration with a Japanese university, but with Norikatsu Matsuoka, I play also Japanese music. Where during my PhD, I was playing with my professor together music, and I'm not sure if the blue vibrations for the glaciers are also responsible that a lot of glaciologists make music. Here in the room is also a glaciologist, which is a very good singer. Um, thank you. That's, that's really fascinating. And I, I think maybe we'll leave, we'll end with this fascinating question of what, whether this particular form of matter or this type of landscape is inspiring to a particular aesthetic form, um, something that perhaps is a provocation to, to you, Julian, as well, to find the right medium and the right way of engaging with the landscapes that you visit. But I know we have so many um, things to discuss. I'd like to open the, uh, open the discussion up to the audience, but first to say thank you. This is a very provocative conversation thus far. But we'll um, hold any further thanks, and um, I'd like to turn it over to our audience to pick up this discussion wherever it might have captured your interest. If there aren't any questions yet, I'd be very, very happy to continue. Mm -hmm. But um, would anyone like to, to take the microphone? Also in Italian. I think, yes. yes, and also questions are quite welcome in Italian. We can do translation. Well, 
I think um, we'll continue then, and uh, please uh, uh, feel free to interrupt. There is one question over there. <laughs> Um, well, this is actually <laughs> a good question. Um, those are not really my images. Those are partly uh, been produced by Johannes Förster, which was always with me on all the expedition, and uh, which is a very good friend and uh, filmmaker. Um, and he was very much involved in the production of, uh, of the movie you see downstairs. And as we were shooting the first time, we just saw that there was so much amazing um, behind the scene to also kind of like be taken that uh, we decided that uh, he would bring a cameraman during the production because he was too involved with the production. And the idea is to produce a documentary, I think, about it. Because obviously the, the movie Downstar, which is for me the most important, and I don't think that you need to see that to understand what it is, but what you see downstairs is extremely abstract and somehow um, very artificial, and, and this is kind of like putting it into um, a more real frame. And, and also I think it's quite interesting for people to see what it means to produce a movie by minus 30 degree, and I, as you probably can see is very different than a uh, scientific expedition led by the ETH, I guess. So, but, um, but it's still uh, sort of an expedition and um, it was particularly interesting to work in this condition because we're working with the very high-end technology in, in terms of like image making, but at the same time in a very primitive way of surviving we were not so prepared um, because I didn't have a guide and I just went before to see if we could survive and then I saw, oh, yeah, that's fine, but it was min minus 15 degree and at minus 33, our uh, gas bottle weren't working anymore, so we could not cook. So we had to kind of collect some moss and make some little bonfire in order to melt the ice that we were chopping in the morning to make the porridge and we were like 10 days in this kind of really strange uh, sphere of... Um, old archaic survival technology and very developed uh, new media. And um, so that's for the, the, therefore we kind of decided that it could become something very interesting to make a, a documentary which were rather abstract. So this is not the documentary, this is just put very quickly put together uh, for us tonight and yeah. It's a f certainly a fascinating snapshot of um, how these images came to be. Yes, a question in the audience. Hi there. Hey. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this um, question about the alternative images or the alternative uh, imagery. And when <coughs> I went downstairs just before you were talking, um, <coughs> my sense was of a place which is almost like a geological time, you know, a, a place where humans don't exist. So as, as if you are part of a, a, of a world which transcends us as, as a human species. And so in a way, so that's my imagery of the pole, I think, or of, a, of, a, of, a, of an attraction also for the pole is something which is beyond the reach of the humans and we are part of this wider project. And so I was wondering whether, as an alternative image, we don't need an imagery which brings it closer to us, which makes it more human, which makes it more, um, you know, it's not out there somewhere unreachable, but it's, it's close to us. Um, was it a question about these images, if, or? Um, yeah, that's very right, and I think that the full project is a bit motivated by that uh, on my side. Um, as I was saying, we have been kind of overwhelmed with the amount of 
picture of both pole lately, and I think that it's a kind of banalization, uh, which I've, I felt, um, I mean, I had misfeeling about it, because it's one, one hand is very important, we're talking about problem, but another hand, like, it's always depicting the catastrophe, and it's another, like, uh, bad news in the ocean of bad news and fake news, and it's a real news, but it's, it's not uh, particularly positive. And I think that there is, like, something that we were starting to miss, and that's, like, this attraction and this kind of magical and eeriness of, of this space. And that's why I actually decided that I wanted to go there and try to create a, a new narration, which somehow is mediated by the drone. So obviously, man is kind of involved, but it's, it's, it's still a, a totally different kind of cosmos. And so to, I don't know if this is an answer, but that's kind of like what motivates me, because I think that uh, through exposition make the places and the magical um, aura um, more fragile, and so maybe how emotional link is done in the less, and therefore uh, sort of about uh, creating this alternative. I think it's it's quite striking actually how easy it is to to start to feel as if seeing from a drone's eye view is is natural. We become I see a lot of drone shot footage, and actually in this case you see. The drone flying, one drone is flying with a spotlight. And I think it's um, actually an interesting provocation to, you know, ask us, are we really, is that really a, a point of view from which we can see from a human eye? Am I so used to flying in my mind's eye um, that the, uh, this is a way I can look at the landscape? Or is it rather um, a very strange way of looking at the landscape? That, um, that we're starting to get used to. So I think it's quite an interesting provocation to shoot in this way. But there's another question in the back. I would have a question for uh, Julien. Um, I find really interesting what you said about this uh, emotional link that we have to places where we have never been. And I have the feeling that the feelings I have uh, in front of a glacier um, are the feelings that I generally have in a huge empty space where I can really feel uh, the power of nature, uh, the silence. So my question would be, what is so special about ice for you? And would you be interested in exploring some other kind of landscapes with uh, these methods or with different methods? How do you feel in front of uh, these huge empty spaces and ice in particular? Um. Well, I feel intimidated the first time uh, I was in Ulysat, in Ulysat and um, very amazed. It's probably one of the strongest things in like the Antarctica. I was talking about it, the crossing of Drake Passage was also um, mind-blowing and, and disturbing somehow. And I, I definitely am um, working on other places and my work is not about the ice generally. Uh, I thought this particular thing was interesting because also the work is about construction and a place like Antarctica is a place which is um, very much constructed in terms of culture and not uh, very much experienced and, and therefore I was interested to kind of like create, like to play around with this feeling and this kind of cliche and like also the the little mechanism which actually builds um, this um, visual culture of one place. And it's much easier to do in a place which maybe is not directly uh, inhabited and which didn't have like a huge amount of people have been seen. Therefore, I was working quite a bit with underwater uh, because underwater imagery is also only like stemming from the 70s. There is not much of underwater imagery, but everybody have the feeling they've been down there somehow, and that's always something which um, I, f I find surprising. And, 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 and uh, so i trying to see how I can implant um, a, a new kind of like visual um, proposition for a place which is kind of built on a fictional um, construction. Thank you. Um, 
unless there's another question, I'll, I'll take the chair's prerogative to ask one more question um, to, to you, Julien, which is, and, and also invite you to comment, Felix, which is about um, the rest of the exhibition that I hope you'll have an opportunity to visit if you can stay this evening. Um, we've been talking mainly about the, the ice and the film and the production of these images, but downstairs we encounter um, a kind of landscape itself in the installation. And can you tell us a bit more about some of the sculptural elements and another film that was produced specifically for Lugano um, that we can we will encounter when we enter the exhibition downstairs? Yes, um, I mean the exhibition is not only <laughs> the film. It's actually for me it's like the first time that I'm really working in a kind of uh, environmental scale, meaning that it's like an immersive. Uh, installation with more than one element, but not like a classical one walk, one walk, one walk. It's kind of like an experience. And um, there is obviously the movie, which is the core of the exhibition, and everything is articulated around it. And um, in between, you have um, the canon, the canon which I talk about, which is covered by uh, the same glacier shroud that they're using on the Rhone Glacier to actually try to slow down the melt of the ice in summer which is not very um, efficient, I would say. And, um, and then you have the stone, which are erratic block, which uh, I really like the name erratic, but yeah, the, those are stone which have been moved by geological forces and the ice, basically the ice age, and they misplace minerals, meaning that when you come to a normal valley in Switzerland, you always have them and they feel so static and they feel to belong so much to the landscape. It's interesting that it's actually stone which are coming from somewhere else. So if you kind of project yourself in this stone there, they're actually seeing the world in kind of like its fluidity, but it's very complicated for the human mind to kind of grasp this different agency of time in different things. And that's something which is also addressed with the movie and the ice is also another agency that the one that we're using and the stone I actually know um, somehow on their own material which act as prosthesis and which can give them sang, or prolong their movement you know, in the museum space. And, um, and then you have also the first walk of the show which is also the last walk of the show depending how you actually enter which is uh, the bossy fountain set on fire and it's all something about uh, the idea that you can have something very, very far, which is uh, looking like over overworld, but then you can have something very, very local that you kind of know and you can reimagine your own reality in new eyes. And it's called, and beneath it all flows liquid fire. And it's the same take on this idea of different agency within the mineral world, our world, the cultural world. and. So that's kind of like, and then it's a plane between the elements and the cold, the heat. I mean, yeah. Uh, wonderful. I, I think, thank you. This opens up the exhibition a bit for us. And I wonder if we'll ever be able to look at um, glaciers or other kinds of landscapes the same way again after thinking through these works. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Grazie a tutti, vorrei invitare chi, chi è venuto per una, un aperitivo cena e possiamo qui accanto e possiamo continuare a parlare con i nostri ospiti che restano con noi. Grazie e buon, buon proseguimento. Grazie.